Okay, now, um, as you know, I'm a trial lawyer, and I'm going to use a couple basic tools today. One, the opening statement. Two, I'm going to give you an outline of where we're going in pieces like a puzzle, you know, circumstantial evidence, drawing inferences and conclusions from these pieces. At the end, if I do my job, I'll connect them all for you, okay? Um, the first puzzle piece, scholarship, leadership, character, service. Those are all the pillars of this fine organization, including, without limit, these are subwords. I think they're important, failure, victory, humility, making choices, purpose, prioritizing, and discernment. Let's keep those as little nuggets out there. Caveat, all of those wonderful concepts are under the constant and persistent negative erosion coming from things that include, without limit, a lack of faith, a fear of criticism, ego, and lack of humility. In doing research for this wonderful opportunity, I found that the National Honor Society was established in 1921 in Pittsburgh, Fifth Avenue. The assistant principal there in 1921 started all of this in Pittsburgh, Fifth Avenue in a high school. The mission statement includes those four pillars, but also this is so wonderful that this is the kind of stuff that this high school is teaching. To create enthusiasm for scholarship. My father did it with a knuckle sandwich. Um, to stimulate a desire to render service. Promote leadership and develop character in secondary school, school students. Early warning, okay? I'm going to move it along, but my wife has once said publicly that I keep an inflatable podium in the trunk of my car. So that if anybody at any time seems to suggest they'll listen to me, I'll blow it up and start speeching at you in seconds. I promise I'm going to move it along. In all seriousness, in the words of Elizabeth Taylor, how many people know that name? I know you kids don't know. In words of Elizabeth Taylor, to her seven husbands, I promise not to keep you too long. Elizabeth Taylor leads all of, the, all of the celebrities to this day in divorces. By the way, she had eight marriages. B Richard Burton got tagged twice. Christy Brinkley, who I believe, it's my opinion, just there's a distinct um, similarity to your school board member, Stacey Fleo. Christy Brinkley was, married, was divorced four times. She leads a whole array of other people divorced. A divorce lawyer's dream come true. <laughs> Back to the opening statement, our puzzle pieces. USS California, Captain Arthur Rostron, Captain Stanley Lord, George Washington, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, John Davids, and Rockefeller. Now, I defy anybody to listen to me long enough to see how I'm going to connect all of that, okay? I do not in any way, and Angelo Papa, by the way, I do not in any way want you to think that I'm claiming that I belong to that group. To the contrary. I stand here before you as living proof that anybody with a strong enough will can do anything they want, and they prove it over and over in this high school. In all seriousness, any personal references are not made to impress you, but to impress upon you the things I'm going to talk about. Also, I love history. I love reading full biographies. You know why I like history? In, in videos, man, things go past you that fast. You say, did, did he say that? Is that? Did I hear that correctly? And who stops and replays him, right? Nobody. But when you read, especially as slow as I do, you can stop and read it again. In biographies of all these famous gentlemen, I have been able to walk through life with them and experience the choices they make, because this is all about choices. And so we're going to continue. Relevant to my resume was the football player thing in 67. You know, they talk about the WPIL championship football, but listen when I tell you this. We had 740 kids in our graduating class. Yes, I said 740. 15,000 people used to watch us in Taggart Stadium, and I was there when we held Butler 8-0, and and we were 8-0, and four times on the four-yard line. I could see the paint of the end zone through my legs and our halfback fumbled the ball on the first play, and we held him four more times. And then we went on to drive the ball the rest of the field and went on to win the WPL championship. I am so glad and appreciate so much the opportunity I got to experience that coming from West Pittsburgh where they roll up the sidewalks at night. <laughs> Teacher, coach, high school administrator, Juris Doctorate in Law, on the waiting list at Duquesne. 
What's a waiting list? It means you passed the test, but you didn't get accepted yet. I went down there the night they accepted, they had classes to start. I wore the best navy blue suit on I owned, and I told the dean, I don't know if you'll let me in, but I won't quit. I never did get a letter of acceptance from Duquesne University. And I ended up becoming a prosecutor. And add to that the last couple things here, two life flights, those of you who know how I drive, and my latest little encounter with basal cell cancer on my nose. I have a paper nose, and thank God, because we have plenty of extra to get away. So my surgeon went in and froze it and did all that. I am healthy as, a, healthy as but I scared up crap out of me. And I want, if I leave you with one message, I want you to never lay out in the sun, okay? Because I think that started when I was in high school. I can remember laying on my garage roof to get a suntan because I thought the girls would like me better. <laughs> Failure. Failure is an important part of what we're talking about. I consider myself an expert on failing. It started with a little league baseball. Um, Mr. Sarandria, I'll bet you hit the ball all the time when you played baseball. I never hit the ball. In little league, as a nine-year-old in 1959, if you can't play little league baseball, you are in your head a failure at life. I used to rub dirt on my uniform so people thought I played. I can remember my father, he was a wonderful father, God rest his soul, yelling from the dugout, get him out of there. He can't hit a pig in the back end, explicit, with a banjo. <laughs> from that, however, I ended up playing football where you don't need fine motor skills, where it's more about desire. Somebody ran past me with a different colored jersey, he had a ball in his arm and I jumped on him. He fell down and everybody cheered. I have to tell you, it was intoxicating. Every person who ran past me with that ball after that paid for every strikeout when I was a Little League baseball player. And I found something that I could do. I found something people appreciated. Now I'm going to give you a caveat. That, that intoxication that came from that applause became very bad for me in my later life. And I will apologize that later. Also, I failed in scholarship. I was not a strong student because I didn't work like you people. Three elections, I lost all of them, but I'm still behind Abraham Lincoln. He lost more than I did. In 1986, when everybody brags about my Juris Doctor degree, thank you, I was a first class smart aleck. I was 36 years old and I'm ashamed at how I used to act. Man, you put a microphone in front of me in a school board meeting and I was the smart guy. I was always the one who was gonna flaunt that education. I am telling you, please don't fall into that trap. I hope I have come a long way, and I humbly submit to you that I'm a work in progress and I plan on getting better at it. Humility is so important if you want people to follow you. One of the things I would be concerned about, if I were your parents, is that maybe, just maybe, things are too easy for you because you're too smart. You're so good. You're so smart. You're so dedicated that sometimes you're not challenged to the point of failure. You must, if you're going to succeed, my opinion, is fail. And sometimes you need to learn how to fail. Because then what you do in that failure becomes so important later. George Washington was my first lesson. I coach football and I always had this problem and I bet you fine gentlemen of the coaches had this problem. You're teaching young kids and they're so hard, they're working so hard, they want to win so bad that they actually go out there and really put it all out there for you, and they lose. Is that hard when you come back and you know your kids did what they could and they lost? I couldn't figure out how a young kid could be explained that that's okay without sounding like a loser or an excuse maker. George Washington in Manhattan, where he had a huge encounter with the British, met up with his, his soldiers and staff and said before that battle, gentlemen, I, can get, I can't guarantee you that we'll win, but, but I can guarantee you that on my watch, you will always deserve to win. You will work harder. You will be prepared. You will outthink. You will outwork your challengers because you do all of those things. You will always deserve to win. And because you always deserve to win, most often you will in fact win. So from now on, I want you to set in your daily experiences, I want to deserve to be the best. It won't happen all the time. 
but it's important for you to always make sure you try to do that. I currently teach CLE classes, which means I teach other lawyers. And we have young lawyers, and I have a couple experienced staff who teach with me. And you know what our, what our biggest gripe is? These young lawyers don't do it with passion. You must be passionate in everything you do. To me, coaching was emotional, inspirational, instruction. I only left coaching because I wanted to get in school administration and affect more kids that way. You know, and I was afraid because when I left here, I left behind 10 years of seniority and I went to Shenango High School and I was filling in for somebody. John Greenleaf Whittier. Anybody know who he is? Neat little saying. For all the sad words of tongue and pen, the saddest are these. It might have been. You make sure, you adults, if you talk to your kids about anything, you tell them that over and over again. In basketball, your players will miss 100% of the shots they never took. And so you need to be out there and do something. I did it, and I went to Shenango, and guess what? I was filling in for somebody who was on sick leave, and he came back. <laughs> and I said, whoa, what am I going to do now? I had two kids, I had a wife, and I had a house to pay for and all that stuff. Now they gave me a job, but this is another little moment in our little journey here. They gave me a job, but they gave me this cushy job that I hated. You need to be passionate about what you do, and if you can't be passionate about what you do, you're doing the wrong thing. So I actually ended up by accident in law school. I think that God uses coincidences to remain anonymous. I, can, I was talking to my colleagues up there, and I was telling them how I ended up in law school. My last next nugget is three ingredients for success, I believe. Vehicle, will, dream. Like a three-legged footstool, if any one of them are missing, you will not be successful. First of all, you have to have a vehicle. Law school was my vehicle. Uh, Mr. Sarandrio's education and his coaching success and all of your fine professionals here was their vehicle, okay? The next thing you have to have, however, is a dream. A dream is a mental blueprint, a snapshot, a glimpse sometimes as fast as a high-speed shutter on a camera. But without that, you don't have any vision. Without that, you can't sustain it during the dark times when you need to stay committed. And lastly, the will, the work ethic. The iron will to do today over and over and over what your friends won't do to have tomorrow what they will never have. And with those three ingredients, you will become successful. And that's when you have to not be a smart aleck at age 36 like I was and think you're successful. That's when the humility comes in. Winston Churchill, one of the most famous men in world history, they once were interviewing him just before he passed away and they told him, how does it feel to be the, land, the Lion of Flanders? He said, young man, the people who died at Dunkirk, the people who died on the beaches in Normandy, the people who died in the streets of Britain with the Blitzkrieg and the V2 rockets, they were the Lion of Flanders. I was nominated to deliver the roar. That to me is what a great expression of humility. With that humility, people respect you and they'll follow you. Um, Self-employed, you must learn to prioritize. I'm moving along here, and I'm skipping some stuff on purpose. I believe that at age 67, some people say, I can't believe he's 67. Thank you. Somebody said it up there. I am 67. I was born in 1950. And I got a lot of hard years on me, by the way. But I can tell you this. It's my belief that I have been envisioned, empowered, energized, and kept healthy because I have a purpose that's bigger than me or my family. And so you need to adopt a purpose. As we close, I want to warn you about the three basic enemies of success. As we close, please pay attention to these enemies. First and foremost is fear. Fear is very destructive. At the extreme, it can be debilitating. As an amateur historian, I have always been frustrated about how quoting Franklin Delano Roosevelt is slashed and they cut off the worst part. At the time of the Great Depression in 1930 through, it was described as the darkest crisis in American history other than the Civil War. In three years following the stock market crash of 29, 13 million Americans, one third of the workforce had no job. 600,000 homeowners lost their houses. Ragged men and women in the cities lived in Hoovervilles, Hoovervilles mocking President Hoover at the time. 
It was so bad that in February, the mayor of Chicago was killed in Miami in a failed assassination attempt on FDR's life before he ever got sworn in. That's, these are facts, by the way. The same month, a bank panic started in Michigan and spread throughout the country. Depositors had seen thousands of banks fail already, taking savings of millions with them. Now they rushed to withdraw more, more funds. By Inauguration Day, which back then was in March, nearly all the nation's banks were closed. Prior to Inauguration Day, Roosevelt, that is Theodore, expressed his philosophy. Please pay attention. This country demands bold, persistent experimentation. It is common sense to take a method and try it. If it fails, admit it frankly and try something else. But above all, try something. Roosevelt had simple but intense religious faith and his inaugural address is suffused with biblical imagery. It is strong, plain, and above all confident, quoting him, this great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. So first of all, let me be, assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Flat, okay? The historians have leave us flat. This is so important, the rest of this. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror, which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. Young ladies and gentlemen, scholars, citizens, congratulations. Never cave into the paralysis of fear, ever. Nameless, unreasoning fear. Do something. Take action. In the next 16 days, we will celebrate the 105th anniversary of one of um, history's greatest object lessons, RMS Titanic. On April 14 and 15, 105 years ago, in 16 days, the, the Californians sank. These are the other names I told you, the little nuggets. Little does anybody know probably in here, there's a wonderful book called The Other Side of Night by Daniel Allen Butler. The Titanic was the largest moving man-made object on the face of the earth. It sank in an hour and a half, taking 1,500 people. There was a boat, captained by Captain Arthur Rostron, called the Carpathia, 50 nautical miles away from the Titanic. And there are stories in this book about the officers in their white uniforms taking turns shoveling coal into those boilers. The older steel back then had no, nowhere near the temper. The boiler could have burst any second. They're going as fast as they can through the same ice fields headed toward the Titanic. It took, by, they took them till 4 a.m. to get there. When they got there, everybody was gone. The boat was gone. Several lifeboats, that's all that was existing. What you don't know is that five nautical miles away was the Californian, captain by Captain um, Stanley Lord. And it never weighed anchor. Never did a thing to this day. People have no clue why that boat sat and didn't come to the assistance of all those people. Lastly, Theodore Roosevelt, Franklin's cousin, is going to give me the backdrop to give you your most important closing message. They were cousins, by the way. One was a Republican, one was a Democrat. Um, Theodore was older. And Theodore um, actually was making a speech in Paris t April 23, 1910. And in it he said, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbled or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man, women, who are in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strive valiantly, who errs and comes up short again and again, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends him or herself in a worthy cause, who at best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at worst at least fails while daring greatly, so that his or her place shall never be among those timid souls who know neither victory or defeat. Ladies and gentlemen, congratulations to you and your parents. Thank you for inviting me. Remember to do something. Do it with selfless purpose. Do it without fear. Do it with passion that befits this fine institution, these fine people, this fine school, and your fine family name. Thank you.